All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. It is seven o'clock. I'm sure we'll have a lot of people trickling in. Um, for those of you that have joined recently, uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that we have um, 78 signups for today's meeting, which is quite a lot for us. Uh, it's very exciting. I know we have a lot of people who signed up from outside of the NESOSA area, which is great. We are you know, very thankful for people uh, wanting to, to join in on our, our talks and, and, and support our meetings. So um, thank you to everybody who signed up. This was obviously an easy one uh, to decide to sign up for because it's just such an interesting topic. It was very easy to promote to people because it's like, it's, it's Russians, it's the Cold War, it's submarines, it's espionage, it's, you know, crazy billionaires, it's got it all. So <laughs> it was a, an easy topic to promote, like I said. So um, the first thing I want to do, again, because we have a lot of uh, new people, but also people outside of the NSOSA area, I just want to briefly introduce the council members so you can put faces to names, especially since we're not in person. Um, so counselors, if you are here, um, if you could just give a little wave or you know say hello as I say your name, that would be great. Um, so I'm Hillary, uh, Hillary Blonick. I'm the president. Josh Brown is our treasurer. I'm not sure if Josh has joined yet. Um, Andromeda Huffman is our secretary. Hello. Oh, there she is. Uh, our counselors uh, that are here tonight are Peter, yep. Peter Clark. Hi everybody. We have Jason Bartell. I know he's here. He might be figuring out his audio. We have Jake Bouchard. Hello. And Ezra Milby. Hey, everyone. And then we have a bunch of chairs and people who just provide general support. Um, without a lot of these people, the regular meetings wouldn't happen. So we really appreciate them and want to recognize them. So we have David Lees, who's our program chair. Hi. Uh, Amy, I'm not sure if Amy's here, but Amy uh, was involved with our meeting arrangements when we were meeting in person. Uh, we have Groot Gregory, I don't know if Groot showed up yet, who does our website and communications. Erin Sumpleth is our new social media chair. Hi. Barbara Darnell is our membership chair. Hi. And Roger Kirshner, again, I don't know if Roger's joined, but Roger helps us with a lot of our emails that we send out. Um, so thank you to everyone on the council for helping with these activities and Again, just wanted to make sure that you guys knew who we were. Uh, so a couple quick announcements before we turn to our, our speaker. Um, we have officially added a, a way for corporate and professional sponsors to join via the NESOSA website. So if you go to NESOSA.org and you go to our Join Renew page, you can renew your individual measure, membership, but you can also join as a uh, corporate or professional sponsor. So if you or your employer um, Got a little feedback there. Um, if you of your or your employer is interested in supporting the NESOSA, um, the fees are also listed there. The the annual dues um, are listed on the website, and uh, we really appreciate the support. We've also added recently some new job postings to the website, so we really encourage you to check out our, our job postings page. Again, it's NESOSA.org, and then you go to job postings. Um, recently, uh, we've had additions from MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, Vicarious Surgical and Northrop Grumman. There are also other posts there that are older, um, but are still active. Um, so definitely check those out if you're looking to for a, a career change, or um, if you know of somebody who's looking for jobs in the area, please you know direct them to that that website. And if you are an employer and you have job postings that you'd like to share with us, please do let us know so we can um, advertise it for you. And then uh, really quickly, just wanted to um, make people aware of uh, two meetings that are coming up. Um, so we have a November meeting, uh, William Schiedler, Schiedler. Um, he's doing a talk about uh, sc uh, scalable nanny manufacturing. Um, and then in December, we have, uh, oh boy, I have trouble with this one, Leonid for <laughs> ah. Leonid I think it's Pagarelyuk. Pa, 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 All right, David, but you might I have to do the intro in yet. December. <laughs> but I get to practice my Russian. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and he's going to be talking about imaging exoplanets, um, which is an exciting hot topic now. So uh, definitely save the date for those. Keep those in mind. Uh, but now I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to hand things over to Mark, who's going to introduce our speaker. Mark, feel free to go ahead and share your screen.
Okay, I've <clears throat> unmuted myself. And of those of you who haven't turned off your phones or muted, um, you should do that for our speakers' purposes. So uh, let me tell you a little about uh, Josh, Josh Dean. But before I do that, let me say that Project Azorian has special significance for some of us here in New England. A lot of the story has only been recently declassified, but a number of us old high techers, Joe Houston, yours truly, others worked long and hard on this project. And, for, and though for many years we couldn't mention our work to anybody, and this is still the case for a number of the projects that are of national importance that we worked on that just remain highly classified. Uh, Josh is a New York-based journalist whose work appeared in Popular Science, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, GQ, Men's Journal, Rolling Stone, Fast Company, ESPN, the magazine, many, many others. He's covered subjects as diverse as peewee go-kart racing to snowboarding in Iran to the Byzantine world of small production watchmaking and startup nuclear fission companies. Um, he's a former deputy editor of Men's Journal and was one of the founding editors of Play, a New York Times sports magazine. And he had the great fortune to work with David Foster Wallace on the late writer's classic on Roger Federer's um, profile and essay. Josh is probably the only person in the world to play in both the WEPA Elephant Polo World Championships and the Quidditch World Cup. But sadly, his team didn't win either one. Uh, he's the author of Show Dog, The Charmed Life and Times of a Near Perfect Purebred, an extremely real yet believable trip inside the world of dog shows, and the life and times of the stopwatch gang about Canada's infamous and prolific 1970 gang of bank robbers. But tonight, he's going to be talking to us about the taking of K-129. This is an incredible story of one of the largest and maybe the most bananas covert operation in U.S. history. And Josh and his wife just recently moved back to New York after 18 months away. And both of his sons are now in two new schools. So his days have just been jammed. And uh, so I'm doubly pleased that he's been willing to make the time to be our speaker this evening. So let me turn it over to Josh. And Josh, thank you from all of us. Of course. Thank you for that uh, intro. Yeah, that, I, I, some of those things I haven't thought of in a long time. Uh, as you can see, I've had a fairly eclectic career. So it's, um, I have a very curious person who uh, tends to just fall into rabbit holes. And I like that this career has allowed me to explore a lot of different areas. And Azorian was a, a story that I had been fascinated with in the sense that I was like peripherally aware that this crazy thing happened, I thought, right? That, that, that there was this submarine, attempted submarine theft and Howard Hughes was somehow involved. And was that actually real? And so uh, I guess it was about 2015. I was looking for a book project and it popped into my head. My family's got some agency ties. I've always been fascinated by um, espionage and especially black ops. Um, and I just started digging into this and reaching out to people and trying to figure out if there was there, enough there there to write a book. And it turns out there was. And as Mark mentioned, like these files had relatively recently been declassified. So even though parts of this operation have been in the open for a long time, it wasn't really until I think 2011 when a, a CIA history was partially declassified. And that's really what opened the, the door to be able to tell the story. So um, I'm gonna share my screen here, hopefully. I should be able to do that, right? Is that? Um, yes, you see. should be able to. Okay, let me see if this works. Share. Yep. Can everybody see that? Are you seeing the cover of the book? No. No. Oh, it's on my screen. No one's seeing that. 
<laughs> did you press, did on the bottom of the screen, Josh? There should be a green share screen button. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yep. There we go. I guess I did that. Here we go. Let's try this. Now, can you see this? Yes. Okay. And you can still see it. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to do a, this is usually about a 40, 40 minute. I tried to shorten it. So hopefully it's 35 or so, but um, it depends how quickly I, I can talk. I will uh, take you through a presentation I've been doing, or I, I did quite a few times when the book came out in, in 2017. Um, as Mark noted, there's some ties to, uh, I know that Joe Houston is on this call. Joe was, uh, appears in my book. So maybe afterwards, someone can ask Joe some questions about, that I don't even know the answers to. Um, it sounds like others maybe know things that I, I don't know, but um, this is the cover of the book. It was called The Taking of K-129. Um, and this is sort of a flyover of the operation um, and the story that I tell in my book, which is a, a narrative journey through um, the story you know, from an engineering perspective, but also from a, it sort of tells the story of the, of the CIA and its engineers. Um, a lot of whom were contractors who probably worked for companies that many of you worked for or, or have friends who worked for. So, um, so the story starts on February 24th, 1968, when a Soviet submarine K-129 armed with three nuclear ballistic missiles set sail from its base in Siberia. It was on a routine combat patrol to Hawaii um, combat patrol obviously didn't mean it was going to war. There was not a war ongoing at that time. Um, the point of a nuclear deterrent was to not fight wars, obviously. So submarines were and still are the most critical part of the so-called nuclear triad, which includes ICBMs and bombers, because subs are, in theory, the one thing the enemy can't find. For that reason, the cat and mouse games under the sea was arguably the greatest and least well-known battleground of the Cold War. Huge sums on both sides went into faster, quieter subs and on detect and detection and evasion. There were 98 men on board that day, um, the diesel electric powered K-129, most of them in their early 20s and some on the first combat patrol of their lives. The sub had been dispatched unexpectedly and suddenly when another unit was unable to go to sea. That means the crew were called back from shore leave that they'd earned. So that they figured they'd be on vacation and then definitely were not. But they were in good hands. Their CO was a 31-year-old named Vladimir Kobzar, one of the most highly regarded captains of the Pacific Fleet. In fact, this was going to be the young Ukrainian's last patrol. Once K-129 returned to port, he was going to be bumped up in the command, which meant the K-129 would then become Alexander Zhuravin's submarine. He was a 34-year-old married father of two, Kobzar's XO, and the two had served together for years. It was a really experienced leadership. And despite the unconventional circumstances of the mission, they were supposed to be on shore leave, right? This wasn't a stressful mission, it was just duty. But two weeks into that mission, the sub vanished. K-129 failed to surface for a routine scheduled transmission. And when there was still no signal a day later, the Pacific fleet scrambled all hands, planes, ships, subs to locate it. They never did. The US Navy though was watching. Clearly the Soviets had lost something, a submarine. And almost certainly the K-129, which they'd observed leaving port and heading to sea. Back at the Pentagon, somebody raised a question. Could we find it? The answer was yes. Using a combination of the Navy's famous but then highly secret SOSIS underwater acoustic sensor network and the Air Force's AFTAC seismic nuclear test sensors, which were installed alongside SOSIS to listen for ICBM test splashdowns, the Navy pinpointed the wreck using anomalous acoustic events, explosions probably. The sub was here, uh, you see, um, well, you can't see my cursor, I guess, uh, roughly at 18040, more than 1500 miles north and west of Pearl Harbor. The Navy dispatched one of its most secret units, the USS Halibut, to film the wreck and ascertain its condition. The Soviet sub was lying three miles down and was remarkably well preserved. Given the right engineering then, it seemed possible to go and get it. And the job wasn't given to the Navy, it went to the CIA. In particular, it was put in the hands of this man, John Parangoski, AKA Mr. P or JP. He had a lot of other nicknames too. Mr. P was one of the most highly respected program managers in the CIA's young directorate of science and technology. 
He'd been a key officer in the U-2 spy plane program and had overseen the development of both the SR-71 Blackbird, or the A-12, as the CIA called it, and the Corona satellite. The decision to hand this job to CIA was not without controversy. Even some people in the agency's leadership thought it was crazy. When CIA Director Richard Helms first heard of the idea, he is said to have exclaimed, but we're not a Navy, to which Mr. P answered, we weren't an Air Force either. And yet, they built these remarkable machines. That first one, the A-12, later the SR-71, was arguably the greatest plane ever built, especially when you consider the speed and secrecy under which it was born. That other marvel at the lower left, still flying, 63 years, I guess it's lower right, sorry, 63 years after the first one took off by accident during a taxi test at Broom Lake in 1955. The submission was codenamed Azorian, perhaps the largest and most expensive covert operation in CIA history. I say perhaps because my FOIA request for the most expensive covert ops ranked by cost was denied, sadly. Um, a cartoonist later drew the spoof of the, of the CIA's logo and it became the unofficial symbol of the program. Mr. P's task force considered many ideas for sub recovery, but settled on something they called grunt lift. They'd pick it up in one piece, somehow. After scouring the country's naval engineering companies, he picked a new fast rising deep, sheet, deep sea drilling ship company called Global Marine to pull it off and design the system. In particular, he handed it to this guy down the middle, Curtis Crook. He was an engineer. Cook, in turn, asked his best architect to take the job. That man, John Graham, would need to create the ship and system to pull off the mission. Global Marine had built numerous incredible ships at this point, including the first ship with dynamic positioning that could stay on station within a few feet and drill a hole in the seafloor, then retract the drill string and reinsert it back into the same hole. Basically, that was, that, those characteristics would be critical for this job. Graham and his men began work on the ship, which would become known as the Hughes Glomar Explorer. In the early days of design, Graham wasn't cleared into the program. He was told that he was designing a special mining ship for a mystery client. Graham, you see, was a reformed alcoholic who'd nearly ruined his life and career, then got sober and became one of the industry's greats. But to the CIA, a former alcohol problem is a weakness. It's something enemy agents can leverage, and it often means the person in question can't get top secret clearance. But Curtis Crook told Mr. P that he absolutely could not and would not do the job without John Graham. So he got his clearance. The ship was built in Chester, Pennsylvania at Sun Shipyard, a short hop down the Delaware River from Philly. There it is at launch. Whoops, sorry. It was very big. 619 feet long. The beam was 116 feet. Displaced 50,500 tons. The cost, good question. We still don't know. Estimates range from 75 million to 300 million, which in today's dollar is a lot of money. But the engineering was just part of the Zorian. The CIA couldn't very well dispatch a huge ship to the Pacific to a place where huge mystery ships don't just appear and park and hope the Soviets would ignore it. They needed a cover. That cover was ocean mining. This wasn't an outrageous idea. The mining community had been discussing the notion of harvesting rare earth minerals from the seafloor for some time. In particular, they wanted manganese nodules, you're looking at one here, which contained nickel and cobalt, among other valuable minerals. The problem was actually harvesting the things and then refining them. It was a very challenging and expensive problem, but it wasn't impossible. Mining was plausible, people would believe it, but the US government also wouldn't just go into mining. No one would believe that. So most, com and most companies big enough to plausibly attempt it were public, they had shareholders to answer to. So the CIA needed a private company that could plausibly be in the ocean mining business. Not many companies fit that bill. But this guy was perfect for the job. That's Howard Hughes, eccentric mogul, loyal patriot, and a guy so strange that nothing he said or do would ever be doubted. How much was Hughes involved? We don't really know. He was most likely here on the top floor of the Desert Inn, hopped up on opiates at this point, but his organization signed on and happily provided the cover. The Deep Ocean Mining Project was then formed in an office near LAX 
in a building owned by Hughes. And there, a fake mining company was born. Its central figure was this guy, Manfred Krutein, a former German U-boat submariner who later owned a shipyard in Poland, which he fled when the Soviets invaded Eastern Europe. He landed in the US after a brief stop in Latin America. Manfred loved ocean mining. It was his dream, and he was ecstatic for the chance. Then he found out it was all a lie. But he came to love the job anyway. And he worked with this guy, a Texas gentleman named Paul Reeve, one of Hughes's lieutenants. The two of them, it was up to them to convince the world that the deep ocean mining project was real. The CIA was pretty good at black ops by this point, but these operations are only as good as they're covered. So the man in charge of the, of the project's so-called commercial operations division gave Reeve everything he needed to perpetrate the ruse. Reeve and his team of ocean mining engineers were sent out to give interviews to the media and lectures to the industry. Howard Hughes's outlandish ocean mining program became famous across the globe. The legality of it was debated at the United Nations. So the plan was now in place. Azorian had a ship and a cover. But there wasn't just a ship. The key component was a giant claw at the end of a 17,000 foot steel pipe string. That piece couldn't be explained. It would give away the ruse. They had to build it in secret inside this thing. That's the world's largest submersible barge, the size of a small basketball arena, as well as a floating dry dock where Lockheed engineers subcontracting on the project to build the claw could actually build it in secret. They called it Clementine. It's hard to see in this picture, but photos of this piece of Azorian are really hard to come by. The Clementine was a giant claw that would be attached to the bottom of a long steel pipe to grab the sub from the bottom of the ocean. I like to explain it as a giant version of that arcade game where you grab the teddy bear out of the toys, like my kids make me waste all this money on it and we never win anything. Imagine that with 17,000 feet and a submarine on the end. By June of 1974, everything was ready and the Explorer went to sea with a huge crew. They wore this patch on their uniform. And one of them drew this, a diagram of, a long and complicated, of the long and complicated process of lowering 17,000 feet of tapered steel pipe to the sea floor in unsteady seas. This pipe, I should say, was also a marvel. It had to be strong enough to hold a 2 million pound object under tension without breaking. No one on the team knew how to build something according to, the spe to these specs. The CIA, via the Navy, recruited the Army's chief metallurgist who designed artillery and warship guns to come to Washington and consult on a mysterious project that was never explained to him. This pipe under tension was dangerous. It's why John Graham designed the ship's derrick to be gimbaled. It floated on bearings in order to keep it steady relative to the bucking of the ship. The pipe could not, under any circumstances, hit the side of the ship. So the work was really stressful for everyone on board. Weather was an issue and the complicated systems required constant maintenance and workarounds. Because of time constraints, only some of these systems had been tested in advance. It was also stressful. Oh, whoops. I'm missing a slide here, sorry. Um, it was also stressful because the Soviets showed up. Uh, twice during the explorer's time on station, the Soviet Navy diverted ships to the site to check on the mysterious ship. First, it was a Soviet tug. After that came a missile tracking ship, diverted from its regular job of monitoring ICBM tests. We know now from intercepts that the Soviets bought the story. And despite harassing the explorer and even a few times causing the ship's captain to worry that he might be rammed, the enemy ships both departed the site confident that this was only a mining ship. They really believed it. Oh, sorry, let me go back one. Um, they also dispatched a chopper though, and it flew over and took pictures. I had a picture of this in the deck that somehow disappeared, sorry. Um, Again, the, the cover story held. And one thing they were worried about was that the, the helicopter would be able to see down into the moon pool, this giant um, open area in the middle of the ship that was there to hold the submarine. However, the chopper flew over, took pictures, and then went back to the ship. The cover seemed to hold. Here's what the Azorian team was after. These are stills from the cameras on Clementine, which delivered real-time telemetry to the ship's control room, mostly filled with spooks. Remember, this is 1974, and these are 17,000 feet down. There's a closer look and another one. That's a surprise. That was a rat-tailed fish. Um, it's blind, so the lights wouldn't bother it very much. 
Very few, if any, humans had seen one of these in 1974 since they live at the bottom of the ocean. This is also a surprise. That's a hammer that someone on the Glomar Explorer actually dropped through the moon pool in the ship's bottom. It fell 16,500 feet and landed on the submarine, right next to the clock that the, to the crack that the recovery team was using to calibrate the claw's positioning. It took them a long time to figure out what it was. What they really wanted was in here, an intact SSN-5 submarine launched ballistic missile. That's the cap of its missile tube. Unfortunately, there was a hiccup. The claw did work. It picked the submarine up. But 5,000 feet off the ocean floor, one of Clementine's fingers broke. And a huge chunk of the submarine, including the missiles and the crypto gear, fell back to the seafloor. The used Glomar Explorer, which had been harassed by Soviet ships and at sea for a month, had no choice but to take what was recovered, what was recovered back to Hawaii for analysis. Here it is seen off the coast of Lahaina in a beautiful sunset shot. The crew did something else important there. They conducted a ceremony for the bodies of Soviet submariners recovered in the wreck. This too had been planned ahead of time with the idea that they might well recover remains that needed to be handled with care. It was filmed and that video was later delivered to the Russians by Robert Gates, who became the first DCI ever to visit Moscow after the Cold War after the wall fell. You can actually watch that on YouTube still. It's, it's pretty moving. This is a piece of the K-129's hull, which I saw in the home of a retired CIA officer who worked on the mission. He wouldn't give it to me, but he did give me a patch and a manganese nodule. We can debate forever whether the operation was worth it, but there's no argument over the greatness of the ship and its systems. Don't take my word for it. These guys agreed, um, was declared a, ASME um, Mechanical Engineering Landmark in 2006 at the headquarters of the company that used to be Global Marine. The CIA planned to go back and get, oh, sorry, I don't know. The CIA planned to go back and get the rest, rest of the submarine actually, but um, then a pesky journal sort of ruined it for them. A series of events led to the disclosure of the operation in the LA Times in a story that had a bunch of incorrect facts, including the ocean where the salvage was attempted. I think they said the Atlantic. For a short time, the CIA managed to squelch the story and keep it from spreading, while DCI Bill Colby personally appealed to editors and publishers at the New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, Parade, and other publications. They all agreed to sit on the story for national security reasons until it couldn't be contained anymore. Then a radio guy named Jack Anderson spoiled it for everybody. He did, just wouldn't buy the CIA's argument that, that this was a national security issue. He saw the project as a boondoggle and announced it on his radio show in March 1975. With Colby's blessing then, all those publications ran their stories that they'd been reporting in secret, which was the end of Project Azorian and its follow-up, Matador, which was already underway. Now the US government had this huge and very specific ship and tried to find a new use for it. John Wayne was worried. He wrote this letter uh, to President Ford in 1976. I will read it to you if you can't read it. I have your telegram on the Glomar Explorer and I would like to assure you that there are no plans afoot to scrap the vessel. Oh, sorry, this is Ford's reply to Wayne. So Wayne wrote to him basically saying, I can't believe you're gonna, you're gonna trash this thing. It's an American marvel. As you know, we were regretfully unable to find an immediate use for the Explorer. Nevertheless, we are hopeful the organiz that organizations such as the National Science Foundation may be able to utilize its unique capabilities in the years ahead. Given present circumstances and our strong desire to preserve the Explorer for the future, we have decided to inactivate the ship and place it in reserve in Suisun Bay, Anchorage, north of San Francisco. Unfortunately, the derrick will have to be removed so that the vessel will be able to pass under the Bay Bridge, but that is the only use of the cutting torch plan. I very much appreciate having your views on the Explorer, and I know we both look forward to the day when it again sets sail. Best regards, Jerry Ford. Actually, the the um, U.S. government made an attempt to sell the ship. Global Marine uh, made a film to look for a buyer. They hired Richard Anderson, who at that time was famous for being a $6 million man, to appear and narrate it. That's also on YouTube if you want to look it up. That's already marked the end of... All right. Azori marked the end of Mr. P's incredible career, though. He retired and was later named one of the 50 trailblazers who defined the CIA's first half century. He died in, in 2004 at, at the age of 84. 
Perhaps the most famous legacy of Project Azorian is this. Perhaps you recognize it. I will read it to you guys. Uh, the United States has issued no official comment on matters related to the vessel Glomar Explorer. It is the policy of this government not to confirm, deny, or otherwise comment on alleged intelligence activities. This is a practice followed by all governments, including the USSR. Regardless of press speculation, there will be no official position on the matter. This now is known as the Glomar exception, quite famous, uh, shortened to neither confirm nor deny, did not exist before Project Azorian. And basically, a reporter had gotten a tip um, and was pursuing information and trying to get the CIA to declassify certain documents. Um, when this operation leaked to the media, we don't exactly know what happened, but Kissinger and his counterpart seemed to have back channeled some sort of agreement that the US government would, in exchange for the Soviets not complaining publicly or worse, like making a national security matter of war out of it, the Soviets would drop it if the US would never comment on it. Thinking being that the Soviets were really embarrassed by this, right? It was sort of outrageous that not only had they lost the submarine and the Americans found it, but the Americans built a giant ship and actually pulled it off the bottom and the Soviets never knew that it happened. It made them look really bad. So I think they were embarrassed. So the CIA knew that it couldn't talk about it publicly in order to keep peace with the Russians. Also, it's a covert operation. They don't generally comment on anyway. So um, the legal officer, whose name is Walt Lloyd, was a, a, a big character in my book, was asked to come up with a way to respond to a FOIA request about for information. Like We can't say yes, but we don't want to say no, because if we say no, then we are tacitly acknowledging that this is actually real. So we need to come up with a way to say neither yes nor no. The solution was we can either confirm nor deny, which is now used by you know, police departments, city governments, state governments, countries. And what's funny is that when the CIA launched its Twitter account, and I believe it was 2015, no, 2014 June, the Public Affairs Office debated what the first tweet in CIA history should be. The decision went all the way up to BCI John Brennan, and this is what they went with. We can neither confirm nor deny that this is our first tweet. I was a little late in 2015 when I was reporting the book and before I could visit the ship, the HGE was scrapped in Asia. The claw is long gone. The only major part of the Zorian still around is the Hughes mining barge. Here it is with no top in Alameda. It's now a floating dry dock and probably will be for a long time. One of the naval architects on the mission told me that at least for a while, one of the floating sea gates, uh, basically the bottom of the moon pool, which the claw was deployed through and the submarine was raised through, um, was used as a barge at a shipyard in Oregon. And Curtis Crook told me that he suspects the giant bearing might even be on the gimbaled landing platform where SpaceX is landing its rockets off Cape Canaveral. Those were the largest bearings ever made. Um, he didn't know that for sure, but he suspected. I don't know if he, heard, if he was told that or if he's just guessing. And that was me in Alameda, oh, sorry, um, in 2015. So um, that's the story. Uh, obviously, it's a much more complicated um, story than that. I wrote almost, a, I think, a 450-page book about it. But um, it was a real pleasure to dive into that story and to meet people associated. Sadly, four or five of the main characters who I spent time with have, have passed away since the book was published. Um, Curtis Crook is still still living, but not in good health. Walt Lloyd, Lloyd passed away. Um, and obviously, parts of this are still secret. There are lots of conspiracy theories and I mean, people may ask questions now. One of the most common questions I get is, do I believe the story that they didn't get the whole thing? Maybe someone here will ask me, so I won't answer that yet. But um, this thing has bred conspiracy theories and rumors ever since. And I think that's just part of the legend, right? I think the CIA was not upset that people might speculate over how much they got, whether it worked or didn't work. Um, it sure made us, look impressive at a very important moment in the Cold War. Um, and, you know, the argument has been made, and it's probably true, that things like this are what ultimately broke the Soviet Union, that they tried to keep up with the U.S. on a technological race front and just couldn't do it ultimately. Um, and I think we now know, and you've been able to get looks at things like their submarines, that the construction just wasn't as good. So um, with that, I will... Uh, stop talking and um, open the floor to questions. I think I was almost on 
the amount of time I wanted to use. Um, so thanks. Um, it's a pleasure awesome. to tell the story. Thanks, Josh. That was great. Um, I'm sure we will have a lot of questions. Uh, if people would like to ask questions, we encourage you to put them in the chat. And that way we can kind of like walk through them um, without multiple people asking questions all at the same time. Um, Peter had a question, not necessarily for Josh, but maybe for some of the others that are have some involvement. Um, is it possible to say at this point in time what iTech's involvement was in Project Azorian? I don't know if that's a question for Mark or for Joe. Well, I mean, I can I, I can start it, and then I think, but Joe's probably well, Joe or Mark because I, I Mark I didn't speak to before tonight, but Joe and I obviously spoke at length. I mean, that's probably a better question for uh, iTech was involved pretty early and I think at first um, was was tasked with coming up with, uh, although I don't think Joe knew exactly what he was building it for at the time, um, a way to capture very precise photography of the, of something on the bottom of the ocean 17,000 feet down. But Joe, maybe you should give, oh, Joe or Mark should, should explain that in a little bit more detail. Did you have yeah, Okay, um, I can do that. Um, when I was first made aware of the requirement, and uh, that was that was a great talk, Josh. Thanks so much. I really appreciate being invited. Um, when I was first made aware of the requirement, it was of course manganese nodules, and the idea was to uh, take a picture of a field of manganese nodules, these one to four inch manganese. Um, poly, polymetallic uh, crystals that lie on the ocean floor. Wanted to get a picture of an entire field of these for mining purposes. Uh, think of a bulldozer. And um, the idea was to get a picture of an area of 300 feet by 100 feet, sort of like a football field, and um, have the resolution, the metrics, and the ability, the stereography, uh, stereographic aspects of it to be able to characterize anything down to one inch diameter. And that meant for a camera to have a light source that provide enough photons so that one could actually see these essentially two centimeter nodules uh, without distortion in a uniformly lit background at three miles under the surface of the sea, uh, and notwithstanding issues of uh, salinity, um, index refraction, and all the rest of it, but the pressures of uh, roughly 9,000 PSI to have uh, cameras, numerous cameras, and numerous lighting systems. So um, harking back to the days of Boston and Papa Flash, Dr. Edgerton, Thinking about uh, a job like that was sort of like uh, taking a picture of Boston with a strobe. And the uh, first thing I did was to order a strobe light and then characterize the beam uh, spread in a cranberry bog over in Sudbury uh, behind our home and be able to describe the luminance of the field from one strobe and then expand that into eight strobes and eight cameras and all the rest of it. What became eventually the Glomar 2 Explorer experiment and um, image capture that provided the parameters for the design of the ship. And uh, all this is described beautifully in Josh's book. So I won't go into great detail there, but uh, no, I didn't really have an idea of what was going on other than uh, mining man manganese nodules. But since I'd just come off the USS date from uh, Periscope Sea Trials, I was fairly familiar with the submarine environment. And uh, my first impression of the briefing was that the field that needed to be required, the manganese field, was about the size of a submarine. And uh, that stopped my meeting with John Wolf short, in short order, and I had to sign some paperwork. Um, it was uh, one of these uh, gut reactions, oh, I see, uh, you're looking for a submarine. But after that, I never spoke about it anymore. And um, that's sort of the background of how I got started as a camera lighting project. So, um, yeah, Josh, thanks. 
Thanks of course. For yeah. some... Oh, sorry, Josh. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Joe, thanks for filling in some details there. And I think that's appreciated by everyone in the group. Josh, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I mean, I just actually, yeah, Joe, there's almost a chapter on, I think there is a chapter on, on Joe and those, uh, those experiments. Um, and then obviously, I, I don't know about ITIC's involvement on the ultimate um, optical gear on Clementine, um, because there were obviously cameras on Clementine, there was video and um, real time video um, up down telemetry on that cable. I don't know, Joe, if you know, or Mark knows, did, did ITEC also build the cameras on Clementine? Uh, no, I can answer that. Um, ITEC dropped out after the, the, um, the pictures were characterized. Uh, there's a 3D rendering available. I, I guess you could find that um, uh, in your uh, log, Josh. Uh, the 3D rendering was used to set the size of the moon pool and uh, created quite a stir because the halibut pictures, thousands of pictures taken from a uh, fish launched uh, as a torpedo from the halibut actually took thousands of pictures. Uh, the problem with that was they were essentially two-dimensional. Uh, there was really not a lot of engineering information uh, I take part in the project was to characterize the metrics of the um, submarine, and that meant um, uniform lighting, no distortion, um, and uh, using a strobe or strobes and multiple cameras were able to create a 3D model. And uh, in Josh's book, the uh, you'll find a, a section that describes the. Uh, the change in design parameters of the ship itself as a result of this new information. So the ITEC portion was really to characterize the submarine for building the Glomar Explorer, uh, not necessarily looking for torpedoes or things like that or ballistic missiles. It was more to make sure that the Glomar Explorer would be capable of lifting this, the uh, submarine and uh, placing it in a moon pool, which was large enough to accept it the Clementine system was entirely different. It was video uh, run by Lockheed and uh, it was primarily an engineering activity in real time. Um, the ITEC part was a static situation, mainly to build a 3D model. Sorry, so go ahead, Mark. Uh, I'm filling in a little bit more from uh, what Joe worked on and others. Of course, when you're at that depth, you need to control stray light. When you're trying to find something that's the size of a, you know, a marble, a large one in a football field size area with all of the, the constituents and seawater and the like that uh, you need to contend with and the backscatter that comes into a camera and where the source of light need to be placed and how do you get rid of that? There was a lot of fundamental work that Joe was involved with that tied to um, stray light and scattering, which actually Joe and I are working on a different project uh, today. The, uh, so there's that aspect. There was another aspect when you're at that depth You'd think that if you had a window, you'd support the window on a maybe a rubber gasket or, or something to uh, help ease the pressures. But of course, I see Malcolm shaking his head no. And, and that's exactly right, Mel. It's no, because the what happens is at those depths, the microscopic fissures that exist at the edges of a window have the rubber gasket material infused and pressed into those little fissures. And as the temperatures change, the window actually cracks because of the soft elastic that's used to support it. So there are all sorts of little nuances where the devil hangs out, which is of course in the details. And a lot of those things were investigated and became a part of the design that went along with the work that was done. Uh, the final comment, Josh, is that when you showed the picture 
for all of those things that the CIA did. It has now been disclosed, of course, that those of us at ITEC did the windows of the SR-71 camera and the windows of the U-2 and the optics for the Corona first reconnaissance system of the US and other things that, of course, we still can't talk about. So it was a wonderful time and uh, uh, lots of really interesting projects that went on right in our backyard here. Yeah, I was going to add to Joe's what Joe was saying about the, the being able to, to generate the photographs and do the 3D model. Um, there are a lot of moments in the operation when it was, came close to being canceled or it, when the costs were getting out of control. One critical moment was when that happened, when they realized that the submarine wasn't sitting like straight up and down on the bottom of its hull. It was actually listing to the side, which meant that they had to make the Glomar Explorer wider. They had increased the beam fairly substantially. I don't remember exactly, but Jim and John Graham had made this like already giant and very expensive ship. The CIA had approved the budget, you know, using black budgets from Congress. And then uh, Curtis Crook had to go back to Karangoski and say, uh, sorry, it actually needs to be a lot bigger, which created obviously increased the cost greatly, delayed the project, gave the doubters another chance to cancel the program, but they didn't. Um, and that was all made possible thanks to the, the ITEC cameras. I had forgotten about that. I remember when the field of view changed and I asked why it changed. And I uh, fortunately had been read in on the project and that was the reason that the field of view changed. Yep. Nice. All right, we'll move on to some of the other questions. We can certainly loop back if people have more like optics specific questions for Mark or Joe. Um, so David Lee's brought up a question about the uh, the, the bit of the sub that was, you know, may or may not have been recovered, uh, what was left behind. Is there any information about if it is in fact still down there, particularly the three nuclear tipped missiles that were on that submarine? Presumably, yes. That, they, that, that it, it actually, yeah, well, as of shortly after the operation, they went back and checked the location and we're going to go back. So I've mentioned it briefly, Project Matador was going to be the follow-up to Azorian actually. So they were confident enough that the cover story had held up that um, the office was reopened, the engineering office was reopened and they began planning to go back and um, to get into like just quickly what went wrong, basically the steel that was used on the tines of Clementine, so the fingers on the claw um, was very strong but very, brittle and they decided they had used the wrong steel basically and so they were going to re-engineer the claw using new steel and then go back and get it um, which meant that they were confident that, that the missiles were still intact and presumably still would be today I don't think we know a lot about what the effect of however many years that's was that 60 years now on the seafloor has on nuclear missiles and whether they would be useful at all I mean the technology would be so obsolete now there would be no point I actually wrote a story three years ago now about um, a guy named um, Victor Vescovo who, who built a submersible, the world's first private submersible that could reach the bottom of every ocean, went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And he actually like hinted once that he would like to take his um, submersible over to take a look and see if it's still there. Now, I don't know if he's actually done that. And I suspect that the Russians still keep a close eye on that spot, but uh, I mean, presumably it's still down there. Hmm. Okay. Um, Josh Brown has an, an interesting question, um, which is that many people wildly speculate about a parallel Soviet recovery effort regarding the USS Scorpion, which the US never found. So he's asking, um, Josh, based on your research and knowledge of contemporary Soviet naval technology, would that have all at all been plausible? I, I mean, I don't think uh, certainly at the time and within like a short amount of like whatever like, like a, a brief window around that time I mean, one reason the soviets were so shocked by this was that and um i should say that the head of fleet intelligence for the pacific um, the, the kamchatka fleet actually had a feeling that the glomar explorer was doing what it actually was doing or, or and yet when he 
took it up the chain to the Kremlin, the Kremlin was just like, that's impossible. Like, there's absolutely no way the American, like, not only could they not find it, but like, there's, there's no technology on earth that's even remotely capable of reaching those depths. I mean, I think the deepest submarine salvage at that point was like a thousand feet. Um, so around that time, the Soviets certainly did not possess the technology. Now, like in intervening decades, could it have been possible? I, I suppose. Um, but I would highly doubt they would even like consider it a possibility. And I mean, they were fully stunned by this, I think. And I think that's why they were so embarrassed. They just felt like we didn't know the Americans had this capability. And I think it's one of the great things about the, this era of the CIA and the director of science and technology and all the contractors like iTech that worked for and Lockheed and you know, the whole list. Um, like really American engineering came to bear in the Cold War and not in weapons systems, right? These were um, alternate ways of demoralizing the Soviets through technology. So I think like the director of science and technology was like sort of what unsung heroes of the Cold War. And that would include contractors who worked on these programs, including probably people on this call. Hmm. Um, there's a couple questions about the leak of the story. Um, David is asking how the leak happened, but I, I believe you covered that in the talk. How is that that one guy? Well, no, not the leak. Uh, I, well, I told you how it was blown. The leak, I mean, it's a little bit convoluted. However, basically, um, there was a break in at a Hughes building in LA, the Hughes Cinema Corporation. Um, for some reason, uh, the CIA believed that a document was taken from Hughes's office safe that, w that was like the original contract. So obviously, there was a white contract and there's a black contract. And the black contract would have stated that the CIA was hiring Global Marine to do this thing. Um, instead of Howard Hughes hiring them, and that Hughes would have had the actual contract he signed with CIA. Um, and the short version is that the CIA enlisted certain members of the FBI to go and investigate this leak to find the break in to find out if it was actually true if this happened. And at some point in that process, it seems that the LA, someone at the LIPD was told, and like a game of telephone broke out, and that cop told someone else who told a reporter at the LA Times and the LA Times just ran with it. Like I said, wildly incorrect information. They got the ocean wrong. They just basically declared the ship with the spy ship looking for a submarine. Um, and it ran on page one for about, I think half a day. And by the evening edition, Colby had dispatched his people to go to the LA Times and tell the publisher, please, like, I know it's too late to spike the story, but like, please don't follow up on it or do anything else and here's why. I think by the evening it had been bumped to like page 18 and then it kind of just went away for a while. Obviously the other papers in around America saw it, but it didn't get like widespread international pickup and it obviously didn't make it to Russia mm -hmm. right away anyway. So when the, the cover was actually blown, when that one guy you know just went ahead and, and announced the story, um, what was the public reaction at the time? Were they on board with the idea that it was this immense boondoggle, it was a huge waste of money? And how has that changed over time, if at all? I think it was pretty polarizing. I think people, it's sort of hard for the public, especially with a black program where it's not like when a thing like that leaks, the CIA can come out and explain itself. Like they did, it's just never going to happen. So they sort of have to let the public say what it's going to say. And I think a lot of people did think it was a boondoggle and obviously they were never gonna be able to talk about the purposes of it, what was recovered, what wasn't recovered. Um, so I think it was a very easy story for people to run with and declare like this was a huge waste of government money or that this is just a way for Howard Hughes to you know, make more of a fortune off the US government. And I think um, you know, that's inevitable in a case where uh, the government entity literally cannot come out and explain itself. You know, they, Colby told those reporters like, okay, go ahead and run your stories and probably gave them a little bit of information, but there was no cooperation. And the, the mission it remained declassified and they did not confirm it until, like I said, I think it was 2011 when the declassified, um, heavily redacted internal history from the CIA's uh, own publication was, was released because somebody foiled it out. 
All right, uh, we have a question about, um, which is a really good one from Matt, Matthew, about um, any hint about what actually sank the sub in the first place? And then a follow-up question to that is, how did the claw column retract? Highly debated, completely unknown. This is like, there, there are a couple like just questions we'll, we'll never know the answer to, I don't think. Um, and probably the biggest one and the one that gets most debated is what happened to the submarine. I mean, there are some wild theories. There was a book written that, per, that, per, that proposed that it was a rogue Soviet submarine that had been taken over by um, a KGB like team that wanted to start a war to like overthrow the Russian government or that, that wanted to start a war because they didn't believe that the Soviets you know regime was standing up to America. Um, but that 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 um, theory, and I hate to even call it that, rumor, um, was based on the idea that the sub was surfacing to launch a missile at Honolulu and that something went wrong during the firing and it blew up in the tube and that's what sunk the sub. However, those missiles didn't have, the sub sank 1,500 miles from Honolulu. Those missiles had a range of, I think, 700 miles. So that's clearly not at what, what it was doing. I mean, the, the, um, an acoustic analyst from the Navy named Bruce Rule has done the most sort of writing and thinking about this. And he he thinks that considering that there were those booms that were recorded by the AFSAC sensors and it, at a very specific location, it wasn't exactly 18040, but it was pretty close. And that the times of the explosions were like very much like on the hour and then five minutes after, I think. He thinks that what happened is that the sub surfaced for a missile test, basically to go through the process of what would happen if it were to fire its missiles and something went wrong and a fire broke out in one of the missile tubes breached the tube the hole like a fire the sub something caused it to then sink um but that there had to have been a breach in the sub because it didn't fully you know obviously a submarine typically goes below its crushed depth and it just turns into like a, a crushed can that didn't happen to this one so it must have filled with water which means something caused a breach in the hull. So he thinks that's what happened, that one of the missile tubes, a missile burned to fuel exhaustion, breached the hull, filled with water, it sank. But do we know, we don't know for sure. We will never will know. I mean, I don't think anyone knows for sure. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot about this that's just gonna remain a mystery forever. <laughs> right. That's, one. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest one. And, and I don't even know if there's someone out there who like how, how, I mean, maybe there are photographs were taken that prove something conclusively. I don't know those photographs. I mean, I'd love to see them if they're out there. Yeah. Um, oh, before I move on. So his, his second question there about the claw column, how did it retract back up into the ship? Is there information about so, that? So they would assemble the, um, so that pipe, the, uh, incredible, like, system was designed, the engineering of the mechanical engineering on that ship was amazing. So basically they were adding, they were lifting, um, I forget, were they 60 foot pipe? So it was all in 60 foot pieces. I think that's, I, I don't remember every statistic now, but I think that there were 60 foot pieces of pipe that were like raised out of storage up to the, a platform up on the, on the gimbal tower. And it was assembled piece by piece and they would lower it down. And when they were raising it up, that they just were taking a piece off at a time. So, that, and it was all automated. So, um, and it was, the ship was populated by oil men with roughnecks who did like all of that work, treated it. Cause it really was like, a, essentially it was a gimbal derrick and this pipe string similar to what you might be doing on ocean drilling operations. So um, piece by piece is the answer. Mm, okay. Uh, I think I'll do one last question. Well, I'll make it like a two, uh, two parter sort of question. Um, so there's some questions about the recovered part of the sub and if we know what information, if any, we actually learned from it. Um, and Barbara was asking if the recovered sub part still exists and if, uh, if people <laughs> know where it is. Well, this would be the other big mystery. So one is what sunk the sub, two is what got, what was recovered. You will, and again here, you will hear everything from they got it all and the, the claw breaking is just a cover story to like, they got nothing of value to, I mean, I, I'm comfortable. 
I feel very confident that this is the true story because I talked to a lot of eyewitnesses on the ship who like describe the piece of the sub in very specific detail, like and you know are are still to this day disappointed, if not crushed, that because it worked, a system with all this incredibly complicated engineering that had never been tested and had to work on its first try, it actually did work. The pro it was like such a freak. The thing that failed was something no one predicted, like the steel under pressure of one of the times broke. Um, so I, I, just, I guess I say that also, I believe that the story that, that I tell is the true one, which is that they didn't get it all. And the part that they got is unfortunately not the part that had the missiles. However, um, the CIA did confirm at one point that they got um, nuclear tip torpedoes, which they did not know the Soviets possessed at the time. Um, the crypto gear was the other big target, obviously, um, what allegedly not recovered, but who knows? I think the CIA, CIA also confirmed that, or someone did that they got some manuals or including, or like one of the um, weapons specialists manual that, that had information. But I also talked to some Navy Intel guys who said that there was like some very unsexy seeming things that were hugely valuable to them. Like they had never gotten an up close look at Soviet submarine construction. So from what I've heard, they were like, it was quite revealing that how cheap like some of the welds were. They found wood in between the hull, um, which all sort of fueled the, the suspicion that like the Soviets were running out of money that they were cutting corners on their programs to keep up with the US in the arms race. And that this actually gave a lot of confidence to the Pentagon that, that we were winning and that our technology was superior in a lot of ways. Maybe they were dumping it all into space or into missiles, but they were cutting corners in other places. Um, so they said, you know, just, just being able to see like what the hull was made up of and what, what kind of welding they were doing. And um, so those people, seem to consider it uh, a success no matter what. Uh, obviously, they would have liked to have gotten the missiles. Crypto gear would be super valuable to have. But um, I find that like the engineers were really bummed. Like a lot of the people who seemed most disappointed were people who were on the ship who worked on the systems and were just like, we. I think the highest estimate I heard anyone was giving before they went out was that we have like a 30% chance of this working. Maybe it got up to like 40 and it actually did work. So there was huge disappointment. I think most of the Intel analysts were, yeah, disappointed, but also pretty satisfied. And mm -hmm. I should say, I think maybe the greatest takeaway and success was that I think it completely, it was another punch in the gut from the Soviets, like demoralizing because like I said, they lost the sub and couldn't find it. We found it. Not only that, developed a system in secret to go and pick it up, which we did under their noses, and they had no idea. So I think it was a real, like, it was a real sucker punch for them. Hmm. Demoralizing. Interesting. Well, Josh, I know you're a busy man, so we don't want to take up too much of your time this evening. We we really, really appreciate you. Uh, joining us for our, our meeting tonight. Um, really interesting talk. Um, I know you know you have a book out that's about this very topic. So certainly people who are interested in more information can can take a look at that. And I, I think I saw on your, your website that you have a new book coming out next year. Is that correct? I hope it's next year, but I have to finish <laughs> it first. Uh, yeah, I, so I'm doing a story. I'm not a story, a book. I'm writing a book about Kelly Johnson and the Lockheed Concourse, which so uh, as, as Mar I think was Mark mentioned that um, iTech plays into obviously um, camera systems on those planes too. So yeah, it'll tell the story of, of Kelly and the rise of the skunk works um, and even past him. I think I'll go up through the F-117 probably. Hmm. Sounds like uh, we might be having you back to give us a talk when that book's done. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we well, have a, I, a lot of people with ties to <laughs> skunk works. So. I hope to be finished by well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to commit to a date publicly. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> we'll just have uh, David harass you next year <laughs> and see if you're done yet. All right. Well, thank you again, Josh. Thank you, everybody, for joining. This was terrific. It was a really, really great talk. Very, very interesting. So we really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It was really fun. Excellent. Thanks, Josh. Great talk. Bye, everybody.